here at the end of the chapter. In particular, I want to home in on the very last verse of the chapter. Look at verse number 18 here in 2 Corinthians 4. Verse number 18, the Bible reads, While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. And then he says this, For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Now, in this chapter there at the very end, you find a very interesting truth in the way that he words it. It's very interesting. Notice one more time, pick up in, in where it's the word for right there, right after the colon. He says this, for the things which are seen are temporal. So when we look around at the world, as human beings, we were created, physical beings, we were created in this world. And the things that we can actually look at and see are material, right? They're materialistic. They're things that God has created. They are physical. Those things that you can look around and see, those things are temporal. Everything that you can see today with your own eyes that God gave you are temporal. They're not going to last forever. When you look at anything that is visible to you, those things will not be here forever. That's what the Bible is teaching. They will be gone one day. This body that I have, it's going to be gone one day. It's just going to go to dust. God will, of course, resurrect it and he'll change us and make us glorify. Of course, this earth, it'll be gone one day. God will, of course, change it. He's going to glorify it, but it's all temporal. God has to step in, and he has to you know, supernaturally alter these things, right? But the things that we can look at and see, they're just temporal. But the things which are not seen are eternal. This world, what we can actually see is only 50%. There are, there are two realms. There are two worlds. There's nothing wrong with using those terms. Realm just means world, if you didn't know that. There are two realms. There's the physical world, and there's the spiritual world. There's the physical world, which are things that are temporal, that you can see. And then there is the spiritual realm. There is the spiritual world of things you cannot see. Everyone in here has a physical body. God created us, right, as physical beings. But you also have a soul. Each person in here has a soul, a spirit, whatever you want to refer to it as. And that spirit, that soul, is eternal. I want you to think about that. That is eternal. I can't see your soul, Brother Russell. I can't see your soul, Brother Josh. But your soul is eternal. Now, God created, obviously, God, which is, he, he is the source of all, of everything. He is eternal. And he is a spirit. All things that are eternal are spiritual. The spiritual world is eternal. The physical world is temporal. God is eternal. God is a spirit. And God created angels, other beings, right? Those beings are spiritual. And they will, they will be alive, if you will, in a sense, forever. There are holy angels, glorious angels, which still worship God to this day. And then there are fallen angels, which are devils. Both are eternal. And they will be here forever. They will be somewhere forever. They will exist forever. Every soul that God has created, it's spiritual. It's in the spiritual world. All these things are in the spiritual world. They will be here forever. Every soul that has ever existed will exist forever. I'm going to be preaching this morning on the spiritual realm, the unseen spiritual realm, and what the Bible actually says about this. This is a subject that many people find interesting, and you can probably look up a lot of videos on YouTube, you could probably look up a lot of just series that maybe the History Channel, all different types of the Science Channel, Discovery Channel, whatever you, you, you may watch, you may see that they come out with all this different, uh, you know, they're searching for ghosts and all this stuff. But, you know, none of these people that want to, that, that, that attempt to peer into the spiritual world, they never go to the Bible. And that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to look at what the Bible talks about, about seeing the spiritual world. And there are many times in the Bible where God will allow your physical eyes to peer into the spiritual world. There are many times in the Bible where God, for just a few seconds, a few minutes, He'll allow you just to look around and see things that are spiritual in, in this spiritual world. I want you to go ahead and turn in your Bibles right now to Numbers chapter number 22, verse number 19. We're going to look at a very interesting example early on in the Bible of this. Numbers chapter number 22, verse number 19. So this is after the children of Israel were led out of Egypt. They were going th through and they were warring or battling against, you know, all of these different countries or nations. And they're approaching unto Moab. And 
and uh, you know, Balak was the, he was the king of Moab. So he goes and he tries to hire Balaam. He tries to hire Balaam, who was not, you know, a lot of people are very confused about Balaam, but in the New Testament it clearly tells you he's a false prophet. He was not a prophet of God. So he goes and he tries to hire Balaam to curse the nation of Israel. So that's what we're going to pick up here. Look at verse number 19 in Numbers chapter number 22. <clears throat> now therefore I pray you, tarry ye also here this night that I may know what the Lord will say unto me more. This is Balaam's response unto the messenger that King Balak, the king of Moab, sent unto them because they told him to come with him. They wanted to hire him. So he said, tarry this night and then tonight the Lord's going to tell me what I shall do. Look at verse 20. And God came unto Balaam at night and said unto him, if the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. But yet the word which I shall say unto thee, that shalt thou do. And Balaam, ro Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. Now, when you just read verse 20, this is a side note, but when you just read verse 20 about Balaam, that's what confuses a lot of people. The way that he speaks, the way that he talks right there, a lot of people think, well, you know, he is a sincere servant of the Lord. Well, number one, we use clear passages in the New Testament to tell us that he was greedy of gain, that he was just interested in money, you know, and things like that. It clearly refers to him as, as he's unsaved. I can't remember the exact word that he uses, but he's a false prophet. It's very clear. Now, in this passage, that's why, number one, we need to use New Testament scriptures that are clear. We let the New Testament, you know, be our commentary to the Old Testament. We allow it to shine light on the Old Testament, number one, and then we use the clear passages, number two. But not only that, when you read this passage, even here, you have to understand what happens. He says, when the Lord comes to me and tells me what I'm going to do, you know, then I'll go with you or then I'll do that. But does the Lord ever come to him? He doesn't, does he? In this passage, and tell him to go, does he actually say, hey, you need to go in the morning? No, he never does. And then he gets up and he just leaves in the first place. So even when you read the passage, make sure you read diligently while you're reading and understand what's going on. God never told him to leave, and he got up and left anyways. Even in the passage itself, you can see that there's something else going on. The New Testament tells you it's because he was envious. Or he was greedy, I'm sorry. He was greedy of money. Look there in verse number uh, 20. 21, again, we'll read that. And Balaam rose up in the morning and saddled his ass and went with the princes of Moab. And because of that, look at verse 22. And God's anger was kindled because he went. So he was not supposed to go. And the angel of the Lord stood in the way for an adversary against him. So he stood in the way, the path that he's traveling with his ass. He's, that's what it's saying. Now he was riding upon his ass, and his two servants were with him. And the ass saw the angel of the Lord... Standing in the way. So his donkey or his ass looks and sees the angel of the Lord standing in the way. Now it gets more interesting. Watch this. <clears throat> it says, And the ass saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way, and his sword drawn in his hand. And the ass turned aside out of the way and went into the field. So they go down a hill or something, or they go down into a field, over into a field, whatever happens here. And it says, And Balaam smote the ass. So he hit the ass and it said, and turned her into the way. So he's hitting her to turn her back onto this, whether this is a gravel, dirt way, some sort of path. <clears throat> and turned her into the way, but the angel of the Lord stood in a path of the vineyards. A wall being on this side and a wall on that side. And when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she thrust herself unto the wall. So she just shoved herself up against the wall so she could try to get away in some way from the angel of the Lord here with the sword drawn. It says, and crushed Balaam's foot against the wall. And it says, and he smote her again. Verse 26, and the angel of the Lord went further and stood in a narrow place where was no way to turn either to the right hand or to the left. One thing I want to point out that you may have never noticed or might not have noticed while we were reading this. Notice that the angel of the Lord, in a very similar way to the way uh, when Jesus just appeared unto his disciples in the upper room after he resurrected, this angel seems to be just like basically transporting from one place to another. Did you notice that repeatedly? He's just changing from one location to another. He's going from the way here, then to the vineyard, then he, he goes back over. It doesn't talk about him walking. The way in which it's worded, it makes it sound as if he's just immediately from one way 
in, in, from you know, the way over by the vineyard and then back over by the other path. Look at what it says again there. Uh, so it says, where, no, where was no way to turn, either to the right hand or to the left. She's trying to block him in. Verse 27, and when the ass saw the angel of the Lord, she fell down under Balaam. So she realizes, the ass realizes there's nowhere else for me to go. So the ass just falls on the ground. <clears throat> and it, uh, fell under Balaam, and Balaam's anger was kindled. And he smote the ass with, his, with a staff. And the Lord opened the mouth of the ass, and she said unto Balaam, What have I done unto thee, that thou hast smitten me these three times? Verse 29, And Balaam said unto the ass, Now those are weird words right there, aren't they? Balaam said unto the ass. When you read this just without, like I said, the New Testament, it should be obvious this person's crazy. This man is insane, really. I mean, if, if, if an animal spoke to you, would you just respond in a calm manner to what the animal said? The Bible talks about the New Testament that forbade the madness of the prophet referring to Balaam. That he's crazy. The madness of him. He's insane. This, he's not a good man, like I said. He just uh, he has a warped mind is what I'm getting at. So he just responds like everything's normal. you know. And Balaam said unto the ass, Because thou hast mocked me, I would there were a sword in mine hand, for now would I kill thee. You know, he goes a little over the top here. Verse 30. And the ass said unto Balaam, Am not I thine, thine ass, upon which thou hast uh, ridden ever since I was thine unto this day? Was I ever wont to do so unto thee? And he said, Nay. He just answers, No, I guess not. You guys, a psycho. Look at verse 31. Then the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. I want you to notice those words. So, Prior to this, he was not able to see what was going on. But it says, the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam. So God intervenes in the physical eyes, the physical faculties or abilities that we have when God created us does not enable us to be able to peer or see into the spiritual realm. But God intervenes and he allows Balaam to be able to see that. Look at what it says next. And the Lord opened the eyes of Balaam, and, and he saw the angel of the Lord standing in the way. And it says, and his sword drawn in his hand. It says, and he bowed down his head and fell flat on his face. So he's fearful at this point. Verse 32, and the angel of the Lord said unto him, Wherefore hast thou smitten thine ass these three times? Behold, I went out to withstand thee, because thy way is perverse before me. And the ass saw me and turned from me these three times. Unless she had turned for me, surely now also I had slain thee and saved her alive. So Balaam actually should have been happy with his ass because it actually saved his life in this case. It actually saved him because this angel even says, I was going to kill you. That's the whole purpose that this angel was sent. And notice God sent an angel to slay Balaam. And it was a spiritual angel, and you know, an angel that he was not able to see. It was a spiritual being that was going to smite him and kill him, and he wasn't able to even see the angel. Isn't that interesting? He wasn't able to see this spiritual being. He was just going to be traveling along, and if the ass, for whatever reason, wasn't able to see the angel, this angel would have just taken a sword and just smote him and killed him, right? So you can see that there are things that go on in the spiritual world that you have no idea. You could be walking past something, walking past someone, some sort of spiritual being, whether it be an angel, whether it be a devil, whatever it may be, and you have no idea. That's pretty weird. There's a physical world and there's a spiritual world. And you, with your eyes, can see the physical world, but you cannot see the spiritual world unless God opens your eyes. Something else that's very interesting about this is, <clears throat> did God have to intervene to allow the donkey, to allow the ass to see? He didn't, did he? The donkey was just able to see into the spiritual world. I personally, because of this passage, believe that just animals in general are able to just see the spiritual world. I believe that they can see into the spiritual world. I'll tell you something that's very common. You hear stories about this constantly. Anyone that's, that owns a dog or owns an animal, there's often times where just dogs will just look out the window and just bark for no reason sometimes. Isn't that super common? They'll just, all of a sudden, have you ever been around an animal, a dog, a cat? You're in a room, and then all of a sudden, they're just like, they just start looking around. And you're like, what in the world are you looking at? You, you don't know what they're looking at, because you only can see the physical world. 
You don't know what they're barking at. Like, like, and people are like, oh, he's just barking at nothing. You know what, you know what a, a, a funny response would that to be? Was I want to do so in, you know, in the past? Did I ever do this? Did that animal ever do this in the past? Think about that. Just out of character, just all of a sudden they're just barking at nothing? I don't think so. I believe because of this passage, the Bible, the, the Bible clearly says that he, opened the, that he opened the man's eyes. It does not tell you that he opened the donkey's eyes. I believe that this donkey or this ass was able to just see into the spiritual world. I believe that animals can just see into the spiritual world. You know, I think that this is a good proof of that. And, it, and, and there are many times where God will open the eyes of man and allow him to look into the spiritual world. Let's look at some other examples. First, I want you to go to uh, go to Mark chapter number 5. We're going to talk about devils for just a moment. We'll look at a couple of things after that. I'm going to read to you from Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 24. Luke chapter number 24. I'm going to read to you from verse number 36. And as they And as they thus spake, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them. So he just appears in the midst of them. Just like that angel appeared and, and transported itself, you know, in, in front of Balaam while he was traveling. <clears throat> Peace be unto you. But they were terrified and affrighted. And it says this, and suppose that they had seen a spirit. So they were terrified and affrighted because they thought that they had seen a spirit. Because it's not usual for a man to be able to peer into the spiritual world. To be able to see things that are spiritual and things that are eternal. The only things we can see are temporal. Verse 38, and he said to them, why are you troubled and why do thoughts arise in your hearts? And then he says this, just to prove to them that he's not just the spirit, he says this. Behold, that means look, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. And he says two things. He says, handle me so you can touch me and see, and you can see me. And then he says, for a spirit hath not flesh and bone as you see me have. So what that tells you is you're able to see that flesh and bone. You're able to see his flesh and bone. That proves that he's not just a spirit. Because if he was just a spirit appearing before these men, before his disciples, they wouldn't have been able to see him. They wouldn't have been able to touch him and see him if he was just a spirit. You should be there in Mark chapter number 5. I'm going to get there myself. Mark chapter number 5. This is the maniac of Gadara is what this passage is. Here it's known as, look at verse number 1, And they came over unto the other side of the sea, into the country of the Gadarenes. And when he was come out of the ship, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit, who had his dwelling among the tombs. So he had an unclean spirit, it tells you. It's the devil, of course. Who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no man could bind him, no, not with chains. So he has a supernatural Strength here. Because that he had often bound with fetters and chains, and the chains had he plucked asunder by him, and the fetters broken in pieces. Does everybody know what fetters are in here? Does everybody know what fetters are? The fetters are the bands. Do you understand what it's saying that this guy did? It said he, he, he plucked the chains off, and then he broke like these thick, like three-inch metal bands in pieces. That's supernatural strength. However he's doing it. I mean, imagine trying... I mean, those things are, are, are meant to obviously bind prisoners. I don't know how he's breaking them, but even if he's taking, like, let's say that this pulpit was a rock and he's bashing his hands against that, that's not natural. You could, you could not do that without obliterating your arm. You understand what I'm saying? I don't know how he's doing this exactly, but he's doing this out of his own power. So notice that this devil, this unclean spirit that has possessed this man, gives him a supernatural strength where he's not able to just pluck the chains asunder. I mean, that's impressive, but that's not beyond, you know, our natural capabilities. But breaking these fetters and pieces... That's almost unimaginable. I don't even know how a human being would even begin to do that. You wouldn't get anywhere just bashing them together. You know, I don't know exactly what he's doing. He's probably just bashing them on things. And I'm not sure how he's not injured after that. You know, that's just, that's crazy. So verse 5, And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and in the tombs. It says, crying, that means screaming or yelling. And then it says, and cutting himself with stones. So he's taking the stones and he's cutting himself. 
And, you know, a lot of people that will get into, like, the goth style music, the same type of people that are interested in going to grave sites, the same people that are interested in, like, Ouija boards and all different types of stuff like that are the same people normally that are interested in cutting themselves. That will, you know, whatever they use, whether it be some sort of blade, whatever it may be, and they'll listen to, you know, a lot of times satanic music and stuff like that. And I'm sure... You know, these, these bands are like openly worshiping Satan. You know, these, we were actually talking about that just yesterday. We were naming off a lot of these different bands. You know, uh, I can't think of all of them right now. Black Sabbath. There's one about Judas. There's, you know, the Lamb of God. You know, uh, there's just all these different kiss, which is knights in Satan's service. Like, they're openly worshiping Satan. They're openly, like, worshiping devils because they are, they are devil-possessed. You listen to that kind of music... You will become devil-possessed just like this man did. And no wonder why people cut themselves when they listen to this style of music, you know, this, this devil-possessed music. Look at verse number 6. But when he saw Jesus afar off, he ran and worshipped him and cried with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? I adjure thee, that means I beg thee, by God that thou torment me not. For he said unto him, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. So Jesus said that to him, and then the man ran to him and says, you know, all of these different things. He said, Come out of the man, thou unclean spirit. It's interesting because is thou plural or singular, if you're, if you're familiar with the language? It's singular, right? Look at verse number 9. And he answered him, What is thy name? Is thy singular or plural? Singular, right? <clears throat> and he, he answered, he is singular, answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. So one singular, you know, man, person, is possessed by multiple or many devils. So all of Jesus' disciples are there with him, of course, and they look and they just see one person. Because they can only look at the, the things which are temporal. They can only see the physical world of the physical realm. And they look at this man... And he responds and he says, my name is Legion, for we are many. I want you to think about if you were able to actually look at this man with, you know, a, a set of spiritual eyes or spiritual glasses. There's just multiple devils. Legions, I believe, is uh, it's, a, it's like 30,000 or 60,000, extremely high number. It's, it's referring to Roman soldiers. It's like, an, it may be 3,000 to 6,000, but it's an extremely high, it's in the thousands. So imagine looking at this guy spiritually and seeing thousands of devils just indwelling this man, just possessing his body. And you wonder why you know, he, this guy is just in the, the, the insane shape that he's in, the horrible shape that he's in, because he has thousands of devils in his body. He, I don't believe that he's just this rare case. Now, I'm sure that there are many people today that have hundreds, if not thousands of devils indwelling them. People you know, that are walking on this earth today that don't only have one devil. There's plenty of people today that, have, that, that are devil-possessed. But I'm sure that there are also people that are walking around that just have hundreds of devils. You walk through and you can only see the physical world. You know, you may walk past a normal person where it's just his body and his soul, just one guy. But you may walk past somebody that has just thousands of, of spirits and devils living inside of them. It's a pretty scary thought. It's a pretty, pretty creepy, weird thought. I want you to look at verse number 10. It says, He besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. <clears throat> Verse 11, Now there was there nigh unto the mountains a great herd of swine feeding the pigs. And all the devils, so all the devils, you notice that? Besought him. So plural, many, saying, Send us into the swine, notice us, that we may enter into them. And forthwith Jesus gave them leave, and the unclean spirits went out and entered into the swine, and the herd ran violently, down a steep place. Now we get a hint right here into the sea. It says they were about 2,000. So let's say that there was, you know, uh, let's say that there was at the least, you know, 2,000 devils in this guy. We could, we could get a number by that. Because you don't know there's 2,000 swine that ran off. But how many, how many, uh, uh, you know, uh, actual spirits that were inside of that man? We don't know because there may have been three spirits that went into each of those 2,000. 
You understand what I'm saying? Swine. Because they're able, multiple spirits, multiple unclean spirits or devils are able to possess one being. So there might have been 2,000 swine that ran off that cliff, but there might have been three unclean spirits or two unclean spirits in all 2,000. Obviously, if it's two, it would be equaling 4,000 unclean spirits that were inside of that man. That's pretty crazy. There's at least two, at least minimum. If you were able to look at this guy, there would have been 2,000 unclean spirits possessing this man's body. Speaking through this man, 2,000 unclean spirits. I want you to turn, turn over, uh, it's, it's pretty close by, I was just going to read it to you, but go over to Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 15. Matthew chapter number 7, verse number 15. I want to show you another example of, uh, of devil possession, of devil possession. Now, there where we were in Mark 5, just shortly thereafter, after these swine run off, people go in and tell uh, you know, all those in the town, the villagers, they come out and they're angry uh, for whatever reason that it may be. But it says at the end of verse number 15, where we were, Mark 5, 15, you don't have to turn back here, it says this, and they come to Jesus and see him that was possessed with the devil, so he was, he's not any longer, and had the legion, it says, sitting and clothed and in his right mind. So was he in his right mind prior to this? No. Of course not we know because he was cutting himself. But from their perspective even, they thought this guy was crazy. They looked at him and he did, he did not have what they would consider a right mind like they had. He was not in his right mind. And it says, and they were afraid. They were afraid. So they saw him in his right mind. I want you to look here in Matthew chapter number 7. Look at verse number 15. Matthew chapter number 7. Look at verse number... You know, it's 17. I'm sorry. I, got the, I think I have the wrong chapter here. Go back to Matthew chapter number 17. Matthew chapter number 17. Look at uh, verse number 15. This is correct. Look at verse 14. We'll begin reading there. And when they were come to the multitude, there came to him a certain man, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is a lunatic. For he is lunatic. What does it mean to be lunatic? It means to be crazy, right? He is lunatic. And sore back. So he's sore afflicted. He's strongly afflicted. For oft times he falleth into the fire and oft into the water. It says, and I brought him to thy disciples and they could not cure him. It's interesting he uses the word cure because it's almost like it's a, it seems to be a medical issue, right? Lunatic. What is that? You know, they have branches of psychology of all of these different, you know, uh, uh, things where they'll study the brain. Because they think it's something that's going on with the brain, Right? It says they could not cure him. Verse 17. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, speaking to the disciples, of course, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him hither to me. And Jesus rebuked the devil. Notice what the problem was. Notice him, him, the reason why he was crazy or the reason why he was a lunatic was the same reason why in Mark 5 that man was a lunatic. Why he was, you know, we refer to him as the maniac of Gadara. It wasn't just some kind of psychological, physical problem in his brain. It's because he had a devil. That's why he was crazy. That's why he was out of his mind. Look at what it says next. It says, And he departed out of him, and the child, watch this, was cured from that very hour. So he had his right mind, right? Right after that he was given a sound mind, he was given a right mind. He, he returned unto being normal, right? We read in the Bible there are cases where people have issues that are not related to devils. But there are a lot of cases where there are devils that cause a physical problem. There are devils that will cause whatever the physical problem may be on someone, right? And you know, Jacksonville, downtown Jacksonville, is, is insane with the amount of bums and homeless people that are walking around. I mean, I lived in a, you know, very close to a major city. It's much, much larger. The downtown is probably ten times the size of Jacksonville, Cincinnati, that is. It's probably, it's way bigger, wouldn't you say? It's way bigger than, than Jacksonville. There are, there are hardly any bums like that. Probably because they just don't allow them. They kick them out of the city. A lot of cities have ordinances where you can't just be walking around. They evidently do nothing here. 
But I was working downtown just a couple of weeks ago, and there was some homeless bum. I was working in a parking garage, and some homeless bum comes walking down this back, like, uh, it's basically, it's somewhat of an alley where, well, alleyway where I'm working. It's actually the city build, building right off Forsyth Street, if anyone knows who that is. I'm working on the parking garage for that, for the city building there. I was running some conduit for some electrical work we were doing. And... I'm working, and all of a sudden, some guy starts walking around there, and he's a homeless bum. You know, he's a pretty big guy. He's probably 6'5 or something. He comes walking around there, and he just starts yelling, Who's back there? Who's back there? And I'm like, what in the world is going on? I didn't, I didn't see the homeless guy yet. I figured out he was homeless afterward. So I walk over, and where the alleyway is, I, like, peek over, and, and, and I can see he's obviously a bum. And he's just yelling, just Who's there? And there, the alley ended probably 20 feet in front of him, literally. And he's just repeatedly, who's there? Who's back there? Just yelling. I had a Sawzall. If anybody knows what a Sawzall, like three other tools that he walked past. I watched him walk over there, so I went and grabbed all my tools and took them back, got them away from him. And then when I got back up to that security guard, I was like, that was a good idea, man. That was a good idea. I wasn't letting him get a hold of that stuff. But here's the thing. A lot of these people... That these homeless bums and stuff that you think that are just lunatics, that you think that they're just crazy and there's just something wrong with their brain, they're mo I, I'm willing to bet they're most likely possessed by a devil. Right. Especially people like that. And you know what's funny is all these people that have the, you know, these homeless bums that, that have issues that they would refer to as schizophrenia, bipolar, and they're walking around, they're not walking around saying pleasant things. Why is that? Why doesn't schizophrenia just cause you to be happy all the time? Right? I don't know if you realize this, but there is no physical evidence. They, they, there's nothing that they can look at physically in your brain to diagnose bipolar or schizophrenia. They have nothing physical that they look at. You know what they do? They say, tell me what you see. Tell me what, how he acts. Tell me all these things. Well, you know what? We in the medical industry, we label that with this word. That's all that it is. They don't understand it. They have no clue what's going on. You know what? On the, you know what they're looking at? They're looking at the things which are seen. They can't see into the world of the things which are unseen. They don't see the things that you can't see that are eternal. They can't see that man's soul and that man's spirit. You know what else they can't see? All the devils that have possessed that guy. And he's walking around screaming and yelling at people. You know, and you know what? When you see these, these, these lunatics and these crazy people walk around and they're screaming at something, they may not just be screaming to themselves. They may not just be screaming to the wall. They might be seeing a spirit. They might have the ability to look and see a devil, to look and see an angel, to look and see. I don't know if you're, is anyone here familiar at all? Have you ever looked up or read about schizophrenia? So the most common hallucinations that people that have schizophrenia that they that they that they experience are, are auditory. It's the audible, the things you hear, right? Or auditory hallucinations. The most common are whispers to them telling them to do bad things. Why are these voices not telling them to do good things? It just happens to just be telling them to cut people's heads off and hurt people. It just happens to be. Think about that. Have you ever thought about that before? If it's just a random issue in the brain, why don't half of them at least just have some random issue of goodness? Right. Why is it just every single one of them? Go kill somebody. Go, go hurt that guy. Go put a pillow over your sister's face. People do that kind of stuff. You know, they'll, you know, there are so many cases where people just hear voices that will tell them, hey, you know, go do this. I don't know if you've ever looked this kind of stuff up, but that all, almost all cases of schizophrenia where they have visual hallucinations, you know what the most common hallucination is? I'm not kidding you. Look it up. The most common, or one of the most common hallucinations is seeing, seeing devils, what they say are devils and angels fighting. I am not kidding. Start doing some studying on that. Look it up online. One of the most common are seeing devils and angels, you know, uh, battling is what they say. Fighting or warring or they'll just see devil's nature. That guy that was walking down that, that alleyway right there where I was working, he may not have been just screaming to himself. I don't know what he saw. He may have been looking or he may have been seeing spiritual beings moving around. You know, they're the sword vexing him. 
this guy was lunatic. And a lot of these, a lot of these, you know, uh, uh, homeless bums and stuff. These guys, they're not good. Pe people feel bad for you know. There's this 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 movement that tries to make everybody just so sympathetic to homeless people and bums. There are a very small minority of hobos that live on the street that got there by just I lost my job. I had no family. I went and tried to get another job. I got kicked out of my house. Just like, but they're not there long. Is the thing. You know, 95% of these, 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 these bums that live out on the street are literally the scum of the earth. I don't feel sorry for them. I feel sorry for the family that they left behind. The mother that's having to go to work now. Or all the children that don't know where their dad is because you're a stinking dope addict. And you're a drug addict and a drunk. I don't feel sorry for that guy. And he just goes deeper and deeper into this. I just heard about a story. It was like eight, nine months ago where some little boy, his father, that's why you don't send your children to a restroom. The only time we'll ever send Michaela by herself to the restroom is I, I will, if I can see the bathroom, I tell her to peek in there. If there's nobody in there, you go in. I don't let her go into the bathroom by herself. Obviously, the other kids, I won't ever let them go in without another person in there. But I have Michaela look in there. And she sees if there's anybody in there, and, 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 and I have to be able to see the bathroom to even let her do this. And then she goes in, and then I stand there, and I watch the bathroom door from where I'm at, and if anybody goes in there, I go stand by the door and I listen. Or I'll send Jessica in there to go actually go in. You need to be very careful with your children, allowing them to go to the restroom, allowing them to do these things. There was a man who let his, like, six-year-old son go into a McDonald's restroom about eight, nine months ago, a year ago or something. Happened in Florida. I don't remember exactly where. But <clears throat> it may have been Jacksonville, now that I think about it. But they sent him in, the, he sent his son to the restroom. His son was in there for like 15, 20 minutes. He's like, what in the world is going on? So he goes in and opens the door the, the, to the restroom. He opens the door up. He walks in, and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, when the door opened, that alerted uh, a man that actually can't come into the restroom after his son. Okay? And when he opened the door up, all of a sudden he sees this homeless bum walk out of one of the stalls and walks by him and walks out of the restroom. Well, his, the dad had a bad feeling about it, so he went over to the stall that this homeless bum came out of, and he opens it up, and his son is sitting there with his pants down. So this guy went outside, apparently, and like beat the crap out of it. This is why I heard about it. Right. Beat the crap out of this bum. And I would kill that guy. That's right. I'm serious. I'm not exaggerating. I would have beat that guy to death. And so the, this guy ended up like going, going to jail and stuff because he hurt this guy pretty bad. The, the bum. Good. He hurt this bum or homeless guy pretty bad. These, the, my point is this. These homeless bums, I don't feel sorry for them at all. A lot of these guys are disgusting, filthy reprobates. Right. You know, when they get out on the streets, they get worse and they get worse and they get worse. They sit there and they lie to your face. Oh, I'm trying to get a job. You're a stinking liar. Right. None of these people are out there trying to get a job. Have you ever tried to give them things like food and what? They don't want it. Like 90% of the time, they won't take it. Do you know why? Because they just want some more money to go get their fix is what it is. They want some more money to go buy their drugs and get high or you know, pay for some prostitutes or whatever it may be because they live a disgusting, filthy lifestyle. That kind of lifestyle, they get deeper and deeper and deeper into it. You know what that lifestyle comes with? If you're not saved, a bunch of stinking devils. That's what it comes with. Right. These guys that are walking around and yelling to themselves, and that, that's because they're sore backs. They're a lunatic because they're devil-possessed. Right. Because they got a bunch of unclean spirits living inside of them. You know those voices that they hear? And maybe it's one of the 2,000 spirits that's dwelling inside of them saying, hey, go kill that guy. You know, it, these, 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 uh, the devils in the Bible are always destructive. They possess the, the man, that, the maniac of Gadara. They have him cutting himself. Hurt yourself. You know what people that cut themselves sometimes say? Very often, people are telling me to do it. I hear voices telling me to do it. People go murder and kill people. Oftentimes they'll say, somebody told me to do it. You hear that kind of stuff all the time. I had a voice telling me to do it. Oh, it's just diagnosis of schizophrenia. I don't buy it. Right. I don't buy it at all. I, the, schizophrenia, the, the one person that I know for a fact this guy was devil-possessed, this guy was like 35, 40 years old. I had Michaela and my wife with me, knocking on his door. I spoke to his wife for I don't know how long, maybe 25 minutes trying to give her the gospel. She was totally unreceptive, just wanted to talk the whole time. And then all of a sudden she cuts me off like, 
my husband would really like to talk to you. She's like, he was totally normal. And then about three to six months ago, all of a sudden, he just almost stopped talking to people. He would just communicate with me a little bit. Then, you know, he was, he was saying that he was hearing voices. And he's saying he was seeing things. You know what he said he saw? Ask my wife to verify this. He said he was seeing devils and angels fighting. I'm not kidding you. And she said, all he wants to do is just talk about the Bible and the devils and things like that. So I come in here and meet him. I had just knocked on the front door. She takes me around to the front door. And the front door is like slightly cracked, right? And I, I peeked in there when I knocked on the door before I went around to the side, which she answered was the side door. When I knocked on that front door, I peeked in there, and I could see one of the old-style, like, big televisions, the big screens, the old-style that were, like, four feet deep. I could, like, you know what I'm talking about? I, like, I saw one of those TVs over in the corner, and I, I, like, peeked in there, and I could see a bed, but it was dark, and I could see the TV was on. But then I walked around to the side, knocked on the side door, and that woman, I don't know if you remember this, but that woman, when she, when she came out of the door originally, she, she grew nice afterwards. But she's like, she comes out real like super nasty and hateful. Like, who's there? And then she came around and I talked to her, like I said, for 20, 30 minutes. But she's like, my husband would love to talk to you. So she takes me around to the front door. I'm not kidding about what I'm about to say. She takes me around to the front door, okay? Opens the door. And that guy was sitting on the bed. The door just knocked on. Okay? That's weird right there. Not only is he sitting on the bed. He's sitting on the bed facing the door. He's probably... He, I mean, he was a few inches taller than me. Again, he's probably 6'4", 6'5", something like that. You know, I'm about 6'1", almost 6'2". So he's probably about 6'4", 6'5". So we open the door. He's sitting on the bed, and he's got long black hair about down to here. And it looked like he's, like, in a horror movie, literally. The hair literally, like, parted right in front of his face where you could barely. It was like, he, like this was a setup. The next Christian that knocks on our door. Oh, no, his hair was like parted in front of his face, and then he had a goatee. And he had on, it was kind of cold outside, it was winter time, so he had on like a, like a jacket that he's sitting inside. I guess he had the door crack, which was odd anyways. But he was sitting inside, and he had on like a jacket and jeans. And she's like, hey, and she's talking to him a lot, and he's like, his eyes are not even fluttering. You know when like things are going on, like you're looking around, like you see things. Especially if you're in a room and nothing's going on, and then somebody, people come in, you don't know me. Like he's not even like really looking around, like he glance like real slow, like he's not worried about anything. It's kind of strange, so it's very strange. Kind of is an understatement. So he then stands up and she starts, hey, he knocked on my door. She's telling him the story, giving, you know, catching up. And she's like, he wrote a really cool, uh, you know, poem that I'd love to read to you. So she goes and gets this poem. And the poem is like just about like random spiritual things. It wasn't even like a Christian perspective. Like it was just, it was just like these random things. And she starts reading the poem. Or she's quoting it. That's what she was doing. She was quoting the poem. And uh, she said, I think I have it memorized. Because she said he just started writing these poems all day long. About like devils and, and God and just spiritual things. She's just writing these poems. That's all he does all day. He doesn't talk to anybody. He was totally normal. Like none of his friends are like, what happened to this guy? They're like, none of his friends want to come around. They think he's crazy. Nobody talks to him anymore. He lost his job. Like, he won't do anything. And he's writing these poems, and she starts quoting one of the poems. She's like, this one's my favorite. And she starts quoting this poem. And I'm looking at this guy like, you know, I'm watching him closely. I'm standing here. He's standing right here, and his wife is standing right there. And then my wife, did you come inside? Michaela was standing at the front steps. Like, and it's, it's like a downtown city, so it's those old, like, the old steps where they're, 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 they're really close together and they rise really fast. There's like three, kind of like what you see in, like, New York, you know, movies or something. So she's standing on the top step, and it's like a shotgun style house, so it's real thin. So we're kind of close together. And the, the woman's, like, quoting this poem, and she would, I could tell that she was misquoting the poem a few times, because every time, he would like move his lips and like say something, and then he would look at her like this, like raise her head, raise his head, and look at her every time she would misquote it, and then she he'd raise her head. Because on the parts where I, the one of the reasons why I knew she was misquoting was because she would kind of stutter in that part, like she wasn't sure what it was, and then he would look up like, 
That's not right. You know what I mean? I don't know what he's saying. He looks like he's about to kill her. <laughs> but about halfway through the conversation, he stops, like, even looking at the wall because I'm here. And then he looks over at Michaela. And he, like, stared at Michaela for about two minutes until I left. He just sat there and just stared at Michaela for about two minutes. Not talking to anyone, nothing like that. The most, they say, the most, the most common you know, visual hallucination is seeing spiritual battles go on. That's what they say. And this guy, as soon as all this stuff just starts coming, nothing's wrong with him. As soon as, as soon as all this stuff starts coming down, you know, all these problems, he starts seeing devils and angels fighting everywhere. All these bums that are walking around that are just like these filthy reprobates, the perfect candidate to be devil-possessed, they're just screaming at things constantly. I believe they're seeing the unseen. I believe they're seeing eternal things. I believe, if I had to say of anyone that I know for a fact that I ever came in encounter with that was devil-possessed, I can tell you I know for a fact that that guy was devil-possessed. It was the whole entire just encounter with the man was extremely weird. It was almost like, like, he, wasn't a, like he wasn't a human being at all. Like, even people that I've seen that are like schizophrenic, like this guy just like had like no life. Like, it was like, yeah, no life. And she, like, swore up and down. Like, she went, she explained for, like, five minutes. It was totally normal his whole life. Just all of a sudden. You know what happened? Some devils possessed this man. That's what happened. Some unclean spirits took over this man's body. And they're destroying his mind. They're warping his mind. Once you turn to 1 Samuel chapter number 28. Because it's not only God... It's not only, you know, here's the thing. God gives certain abilities to the devil. He allows the devil to do certain things. The Bible talks about witches. The Bible talks about familiar spirits. The Bible talks about, you know, what you would consider like a warlock or, or things along this line. I'm going to read to you from Deuteronomy chapter number 18, verse number 10. Real quick. God warns against this. He says, there shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Or that useth divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch, he says, or a charmer, or a, or a consulter with familiar spirits. I want you to notice that, a consulter with familiar spirits. Familiar spirits are, you know, unclean spirits, things of that nature. Or a wizard, or a necromancer. A necromancer, does anyone know what necromancy is? That's someone that communicates with the dead. Someone that speaks to the dead. They'll communicate with the dead. You know, they're obviously raising the dead in the sense that they're, they're, they're calling them up. They're conjuring up spirits and then speaking and communicating with these spirits. Now, I want you to listen to this. Now, listen to what it says. For all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. So he says, all that do these things are an abomination unto the Lord. And because of these abominations... The Lord thy God doth drive them out from before thee. Exodus 22, 18. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. Now, if they're just pretending, if they're just not really communicating with spirits, if they're really not really crossing any line, or it's just all fake, you think God would be putting these people to death? You'd be thinking he'd be saying all that do these things are an abomination? No. So there, there is the ability... For, for evil people, for the devil, to use mankind and to give them the power to conjure up spirits. To be able to speak to people that are dead. You know, the, uh, the, to be able to peer into, if you will, the spiritual world. Just like God opened Balaam's eyes, the devil can open man's eyes. I want you to, I want you to look at this. I'm going to show you 1 Samuel chapter number 28. Let me get there myself. 1 Samuel chapter number 28. 1 Samuel chapter number 28. We're looking at verse number 7. 1 Samuel chapter number 28. Then said Saul unto his servants, Seek me a woman that hath a familiar spirit. I said, that's talking about a woman that has an unclean spirit. That's what it is. So this person that's about to call these spirits up, she herself has an unclean spirit. She has a devil. A familiar spirit that I may go to her and inquire of her. And his servant said to him, Behold, 
There is a woman that hath a familiar spirit at indoors. There's a woman that has an unclean spirit at indoors. She has another spirit in her. And Saul disguised himself and put on other raiment. And he went and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night and he said, I pray thee, divine unto me by the familiar spirit. So notice she's not, she's not able, uh, divine is talking about prophesying. That's what that's referring to specifically. Divine unto me by the familiar spirit. So notice this familiar spirit is what gives the ability to divine. By the familiar spirit, divine unto me. Look what it says next. <clears throat> And bring, him, and bring me him up, whom I shall name unto thee. And the woman said unto him, Behold, thou knowest what Saul hath done, how he hath cut off those that have familiar spirits and the wizards out of the land. Wherefore then layest thou a snare for my life to cause me to die? And Saul sware to her by the Lord, saying, As the Lord liveth, there shall no punishment happen to thee for this thing. Then said the woman, Whom shall I bring up unto thee? And he said, Bring me up Samuel. And when the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice. So she screamed. So it, that's interesting to me. If she's someone that does this all the time, why is she screaming out? Why is she yelling out? Look what it says next. I don't have an answer for you. I'm not getting ready to answer that for you. But that's, that's interesting to me. Look at what it says next. And she, it says, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spake to Saul, saying, Why hast thou deceived me? For thou art Saul. And the king said unto her, Be not afraid, for what sawest thou? And the woman said unto Saul, I saw gods ascending out of the earth. And he said unto her, What form is he of? And she said, An old man cometh up, and he is covered with a mantle. And Saul perceived that it was Samuel. And he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. So notice that she was able... So people say, well, that wasn't really Samuel. I've heard that many, many times. This wasn't really Samuel. But it, it says right there, number one, And Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he stooped with his face to the ground and bowed himself. Now watch this, verse 15. And Samuel... This is the Holy Ghost speaking right now. This is not Saul speaking. This is not someone telling you what they saw. The God, is, God says this. And Samuel said to Saul. Is Saul really Saul in this passage? Well, Samuel's really Samuel. And Samuel said to Saul, Why hast thou disquieted me to bring me up? And Saul answered, I am sore distressed for the Philistine to make war against me. And God has departed from me and answereth me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. <clears throat> Therefore I have called thee, that thou mayest make known unto me what I shall do. Then said Samuel, Wherefore then dost thou ask of me, seeing the Lord is departed from thee, and is become thine enemy? And the Lord hath done to him as he spake by me. For the Lord hath rent the kingdom out of thine hand, and given it to thy neighbor, even to David. And then he said, verse 18, Because thou obeyest not the voice of the Lord, nor executest his fierce wrath upon Amalek. Therefore hath the Lord done this thing unto thee this day. So he keeps talking, verse 20, we'll end right here. Then Saul fell straightway all along on the earth and was sore afraid because of the words of Samuel. And there was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day nor all the night. Now notice that this woman had the ability to conjure up a real spirit. And this was for sure Samuel. Samuel comes up and it says, and Samuel said unto Saul. She had the ability. This was not the power of God. God would put this person to death. God commanded for this not to happen. And the reason why God puts them to death is because they use those unclean spirits and they abuse that power and they get into a world and they start messing with the spiritual realm of things that they are not supposed to be messing with. Conjuring up spirits of sorts. Conjuring up different types of familiar spirits or things. Unclean spirits. So not only does God have the ability to do this, God also allows or, or gives the ability unto Satan, unto devils to be able to do these things. So do you know what these bunch of these lunatics and crazy you know, hobos that are walking around, when, they're, when that guy was walking down that, that alley, the devil could be the one opening that guy's eyes and vexing him by allowing him to see these devils. Yo, the devil could be the one, all these people that are schizophrenic, God's not doing that to them. God's not just, just vexing 
all these all these people, you know, all these different people. You know what's going on is the devil's opening their eyes. The devil's using that, allowing them. And you know what did the disciples say? They were scared when they saw the spirit. It's scary. You know, it, it's when you're used to just walk around this normal world, and then all of a sudden, you know, you see an angel or a devil or something of that sort going on. It's terrifying. The disciples were afraid. You know what the devil does? He opens their eyes and just vexes them and, and, and brings terror into their, into their minds by allowing them to see these things. I want you to turn in your Bibles to, uh, we're going to look at another thing here. Go to uh, 2 Kings chapter number 6. 2 Kings chapter number 6. The word spirit and the word ghost are used interchangeable. Matthew chapter number 14, verse number 26, the Bible says this, And when the disciples saw him, that's Jesus, walking on the sea, they were troubled. That means they were afraid. They were scared. They were troubled saying, it is a spirit. It's like saying, it is a ghost. It is a spirit that says, and they cried out for fear. Notice, it's, it's a scary thing. It's terrifying. It's scary to them, the thought of seeing a ghost or a spirit, even in this sense here. <clears throat> I want you to go to, as I said, yeah, 2 Kings. So it's just a couple of books to the right. If you're not there already, 2 Kings chapter number 6. There are spiritual wars that go on in the world that you can't see. We just see the things that are temporal. Things which are seen are temporal, but you can't see the things which are eternal. You, you can't see the spiritual world unless God allows you to do it. And there are, there are spiritual war, wars that are going on all the time around you. Look at 2 Kings chapter number 6, verse number 11. It says, therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants and said unto them, Will you not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. And he said, Go and spy where he is, that I may send and fetch him. And he was told him, and it was told him, saying, Behold, he is in Dothan. Therefore sent he thither horses and chariots and a great host. And they came by night and compassed the city about. And when the servant of the man of God was risen early and gone forth, behold, an host compassed the city, both with horses and chariots. And it says this, And his servant said unto him, So this is Elisha's like protege. You know, it, it's most likely Gehazi, because Gehazi was the man that followed Elisha, if you're not familiar with that. So it says, <clears throat> The, his servant said to him, Alas, my master, how shall we do? He's saying, What are we going to do? We're about to die. An army has us compassed round about. Now look at verse 16. And he answered, Fear not, for they that be with us are more than they that be with them. And Gehazi's like, Ah, oh, he's lost his mind. It's just me and him. He's, he's finally gone crazy. You know, but look what it says next. Verse 17. And Elisha prayed and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes. Does that sound familiar? It's exactly what God did to Balaam. The Bible says that God did to Balaam. Open his eyes that he may see. See what? See it in the spiritual realm. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. That's super cool. Yeah. So he opens Gehazi's eyes, and he looks around... And the mountain is just filled. And there's way more of these chariots, the chariots of God, of the angels of the Lord, than there are of Syria. It's like, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes. And then he looks around. Imagine just all of a sudden, like, boom. And then you look around, and there's just like tons of chariots, soldiers, angels standing there. And you can just see this massive army. And Elisha's just like, I told you. Right? <laughs> Can you imagine that? You don't think that'd be frightening for a second? Just all of a sudden being able to just see into that spiritual world like that. You know, God created us to be able to see certain things, but there's a you gotta understand that the things that you see are only the things that are temporal. There's there are spirits in eternal. Even like I said, what we're looking at here, I can only see your tabernacle, is what it's called. It's called a tabernacle because who you really are, your spirit and your, you know, the soul of Josh Hall dwells inside of that body or that tabernacle inside of there. And that's actually what's eternal. You know what? <clears throat> All these spirits of angels and devils, God didn't give them a physical body. They're basically, in a sense, just spirits going around that you can't see. Just like I can't see your spirit. They're just a spirit without a physical body. 
that are just traveling around and doing, you know, whatever they're doing. You know, I don't know what all the spirits are doing. Devils are possessing people. Angels are protecting people. Look at another passage. Go to Daniel chapter number 2, or 10, I'm sorry. Daniel chapter number 10 where we see, you know, a spiritual war going on again that man is unable to see with his physical eyes. Daniel chapter number 10. <clears throat> Right after the book of Ezekiel, Daniel chapter number 10. Look at Daniel chapter number 10. Look at verse number 1. In the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia, a thing was revealed unto Daniel, whose name was called Belteshazzar. And the thing was true, but the time appointed was long. And he understood the thing and, and had understanding of the vision. In those days, I, Daniel, was mourning three full weeks. I ate no pleasant bread, neither came flesh nor wine in my mouth. Neither did I anoint myself at all till three whole weeks were fulfilled. And in the four and, 20 day, four and 20th day of the first month, as I was by the side of the great river, which is Hittichel. Remember I mentioned this in Genesis chapter number 3. We read about Hittichel. This is the only other time that the river Hittichel, that's mentioned in Genesis 3, is brought up in the Bible. Just the two mentions. Verse 5, Then I lifted up mine eyes and looked, and behold, a, cer a certain man clothed in linen, whose loins were girded with the fine gold of Euphrates. His body also was like the barrel, and his face as the appearance of the lightning. And his eyes as lamps of fire, and his arms and his feet like in color to polished brass. And the voice of his words like the voice of a multitude. And I, Daniel, alone saw the vision. For the men that were with me saw not the vision. But a great earthquaking fell upon them so that they fled to hide themselves. Therefore I was left alone and saw this great vision. And there remained no strength in me, for my comeliness was turned in me into corruption, and I retained no strength. Yet heard I the voice of his words. And when I heard the voice of his words, then was I in a deep sleep on my face, and my face toward the ground. And behold, a hand touched me, which sat me upon my knees and upon the palms of my hands. And he said unto me, O Daniel... A man greatly beloved, understand the words that I speak unto thee, and stand upright, for unto thee am I now sent. And when he had spoken this word unto me, I stood trembling. Then said he unto me, Fear not, Daniel, for from the first day that thou didst set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God, thy words were heard. So remember, three whole weeks went by. He's saying that first day when you started fasting and praying, we heard your words, though God heard your words at that time. So it says, uh, <clears throat> where, where am I at? I lost my place. 12, did set thine heart to understand and to chasten thyself before thy God. Thy words were heard, and I am come for thy words. Watch this. But the prince of the kingdom of Persia withstood me one and twenty days. But lo, Michael, this is Michael the archangel, Michael, one of the chief princes, came to help me. And I remained there with the kings of Persia. So notice it says that he remained there with the kings of Persia. Now, I don't believe that the kings of Persia and, the, and then this army of Persia that's mentioned is the actual army or kings of the physical kingdom of Persia. I believe that it was spiritual beings that were fighting alongside of them. It'd be just like all the angels that fight alongside of the nation of Israel. That goes forth when the, when the angel of the Lord goes forth and just slays all of the men and there's just a pool of blood, right? You know what I'm talking about? It, it's just like that. Those spiritual beings that are fighting for Israel. He's saying, I fought alongside for this side with Michael. And then we were fighting these people, which is the kingdom of Persia. But they're not fighting, you know, the, the, the actual physical nation of Persia was not able to withstand a spiritual army. You understand what I'm saying? It's just like all those that were standing on side of Elisha for, you could say, for the nation of God, for the nation of Israel. And what was it? It was an, uh, the, the Syrian army. But behind the Syrian army, you know what there probably was? It's probably, there could have been other spiritual, uh, and other spiritual beings, other spiritual army that was with the Syrian army as well at that time. So here it says that there was a battle going on. So th that's the point that I want to get across to you right now. I want you to notice is that when Daniel prays to God, God sends an angel to him immediately. But the reason why he wasn't able to make it right away, he was held up or deterred for three weeks because there was a spiritual battle going on. 
that, that this angel had to inform Daniel about. Because Daniel had no clue. No idea. So there are spiritual fights and spiritual wars, spiritual battles, literal battles that are going on in the spiritual world that you have no idea about. Just like a devil would battle individually with one person. I mean, that's what's going on with possession. You wonder why people are just screaming out random things that don't make sense? Yeah, the first statement might have came from one unclean spirit. Another statement came from another unclean spirit. And then the third statement actually came from the person of, whom, of whose body that is. You understand what I'm saying? There's, what? They're just, they just speak nonsensical. Nothing they say you know, makes sense. That's probably why. These, these lunatics, right? I want you to turn to Revelation chapter number 12. Go to your Bibles to Revelation chapter number 12. <clears throat> Revelation chapter number 12. Why don't you look at verse number 7? Revelation chapter number 12, verse number 7. The Bible says, And there was war in heaven. Notice that. In heaven there was war. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. That's the devil. And the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not. Neither, neither was their place found anymore in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. With him. I want you to notice that there's a battle going on in heaven, an actual war, and God throws them out of heaven and he says there's no place found for him. So the angels in heaven are victorious. The devils lose, but they're cast down to the earth. Now watch what it says next. Verse number 10. And I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now has come salvation and strength and the, uh, the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God night and day. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives unto the death. Now watch this. Therefore rejoice ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. So notice the people in heaven should rejoice. Right? Now look what it says next. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath. Because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. So there's a, 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 you know, a spiritual war that goes on. Some sort of, I don't know how you would refer to it, but an actual hand-to-hand -hand spiritual battle or war combat that goes on in heaven. The angels in heaven are victorious and they cast out the devil and all of his angels. It's like, oh, now that they're going down in the physical world, they'll be okay because they can't really engage. No, it doesn't work like that. We cast them out and we won, but now woe unto you. So notice... That's a scary thing when the devil comes down. All of his angels. He's saying the battle's not over yet. Now he's going to be fighting you. He's not fighting us in heaven anymore. Now he's going to be engaging the spirits on earth of the human beings. Right? 2 Corinthians chapter number 10 verse number 3 tells us, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. And the Bible says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. Turn to Ephesians chapter number 6. We're going to end there. Ephesians chapter number 6. Ephesians chapter number 6. <clears throat> so when we walk around, you're only really seeing 50% of what's going on. You can only see the things which are temporal. There are things which are eternal, which are spiritual. Those things are forever. And those things, there's battles going on, there's devils, there's unclean spirits possessing people. Look at Ephesians chapter number 6, verse number 10. The Bible says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his, his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand. That you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. The wiles are like trickery. But we wrestle not against flesh and blood. So we're not fighting against flesh and blood. We're not fighting a physical battle but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. Do you know who the ruler of this world is? The Bible says that, that Satan, that the devil, is the prince of the power of the air. That's what this is talking about. It's not talking about, you know, a physical person that's ruling in this world. The devil is the prince of the power of this earth. He is the god of this world, the Bible says. It's speaking of Satan and of his devils and of his demons and the fallen angels with them. 
It says against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of, of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Now watch this. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. So there is an armor. There is a spiritual armor. There is a spiritual battle that you're engaged in and you're a soldier in this battle. You're on a side and the devil knows what side you're on. Whether, whether you want to be in this fight or not, you're in it. And you know what? Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God. What's the implication there if you don't take it? You're not going to be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Oh, if, you don't fight, if I just don't want to fight and I don't put my armor on, then I'm, just, I'm going to be okay. No, you're not. No, he's still going to attack you, and you're going to be vulnerable. So he says, Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, having done all to stand. So there are certain preparations in order for us to succeed in this spiritual battle, in this spiritual war that's going on. And then he tells us this. Pay close attention. I'm going to read through these quickly. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth. So you need to have the truth. What is it? The word is truth, right? Your loins girt about with truth. You need to be right about the teachings of the Bible. We need to know that we we need to know what the Bible teaches. And having on the breastplate of righteousness, we need to be living a righteous life in order to be able uh, to be successful in the spiritual battle of the world. It says in verse 15, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. If people aren't going out and going soul winning, they're losing in the spiritual battle. Right. If they don't have the preparation of the gospel of, of peace, if their feet are not shod, if their feet are not decked with the shoes that they need that, that prepares them to go out and preach, if they're not prepared to preach the gospel, they're going to lose in the spiritual battle. Look at verse 16. Above all, so this is the most important thing, taking the, take the, taking, I'm sorry, the shield of faith wherewith, so with that, ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. So that's your protection right there. That's the shield of faith. And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. So notice the only offensive weapon you have is the sword of the Spirit. So if you're going to be able to engage in this battle, you're going to use the sword of the Spirit, and it tells you which is the Word of God. Amen. If you don't know the Bible, if you don't know the Word of God, you're going to, you're going to be destroyed. You can have great faith and block all those darts for a while, but they'll hit you eventually. Every once in a while, they're going to hit you. Life's not perfect. You're not going to you know, never have downfalls. You're never going to not... The devil's just... You know, it's not going to just go through life and the devil's never going to touch you, right? You have to be engaging back in battle. Imagine a person that's just, just constantly just guarding themselves and only on the defense all the time. They're going to get hit sometimes, right? But they're never hitting their opponent back. They would lose eventually. Do you know what you need to do? You need to know your Bible well enough and you need to know how to use it. You need to be able to go out and engage Jehovah's Witnesses, those people that have those devils, some of those people that are maybe just under the, you know, uh, under the influence of a devil, that have been deceived by the devil, they're on this side of the spiritual battle and you're over here. And you need to know your Bible well enough to be able to be successful, to be able to engage them and use that, that weapon, the only offensive weapon that you have. There's no excuse for not having answers. We have everything. It's all in that book, and if you don't read it, that's your fault, not anybody else's. If you don't know how to answer something that a Jehovah's Witness brings up, then you just don't know your Bible well enough. That's your fault. If you don't know how to answer a Mormon, that's your fault. Nobody else. Right. You know what that means? You haven't done all to stand. You, you're going to lose because of yourself, personally. There are, there's a battle going on with the church, of course. All the churches, there, you know, the, the real churches, Christian churches, Baptist churches, people that are saved... There's a spiritual battle going on in mass, but there's also a personal battle going on. And you need to be prepared. Man. You need to know your Bible well enough. And here's the thing. You need, you know, when you actually read and study all this, you realize that right now I don't know what type of spirits are in here. I don't know what kind of person I'm speaking to, what, how many spirits they have in you. But there are real spiritual battles that are going on. Real spiritual battles. And when Jesus comes to earth, he's walking around preaching. He's walking around during his ministry. And what's he doing? He's casting out devils. He's preaching the word of God. He's getting people saved. That he is 
fighting spiritually. He's fighting in the world that the disciples couldn't see, wasn't he? He was engaging in battle of the things which are unseen. And that's what we need to be doing. We need to be focusing on the things which are spiritual. We need to be focusing and learning more about all the things which are spiritual. And I'm not just saying like, I'm not saying at all like, hey, we need to learn about spirits and ghosts in that sense. No, I'm saying this, the Bible will cause you to be spiritually minded and to know the things which you need to do as far as righteousness, joy, peace, walking in the spirit, living properly, being prepared to fight the spiritual battle. And you know, this right here is your only offensive weapon. You know what? You can't just have a weapon either. You have to have protection. You have to have some sort of defense. You have to have a shield. You have to be shod. Your feet have to be shod. You can't be vulnerable. You have to have the helmet of salvation. You have to have all these things, right? You need to make sure you're fully decked for the fight. You're fully prepared. Make sure that you know how to use the sword of the Spirit. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord, for Show us, showing us all these things in the Bible, helping us to be prepared. You know, we thank you, dear Lord God, uh, for salvation. We thank you for giving us the you know, uh, ministry of reconciliation so we can have our feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. We thank you for the truth. We thank you for righteousness, showing us how to live and, and everything that's written in your word. We ask you that you would uh, just strengthen us, dear Lord, and allow us not to be vulnerable for the spiritual battles that are going on around us and allow us not to be naive just to think that everything that we see is just is, are the only things that are out there. Just be with us, guide us, help us to learn from your word. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. amen. amen.